Do you know that kind of faith? Do you know and have that kind of testimony? Do you know when your dungeon was shaken and your, your, your chains fell off? The writer of that song, and can it be, it says, no condemnation. He says, my chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. I want to ask you, do you have your own testimony today? Can you testify about the goodness and the greatness of God and not providing with all your provisions? I take those things as ordinary. They come along as part of the package. But the major theme and the major thrust of the package is to know Jesus and to have him as Lord. Everything else is secondary. Sing it again.
you shout hallelujah. hallelujah for how many of you are going to praise God today come on put your hands into there and give him a wave God has been so good so gracious so kind to us he has kept us 
through this week, he has kept us in our right minds. We're not out there on the street counting lampposts. I say thank you, Jesus. Somebody, we even if we just had some tea this morning, we had some food last night, I say thank you, Jesus. We have a little money in our pockets. We say thank you, Jesus. We can come, we can see, we can hear, we can see the next person on the side of us. We can feel, I say thank you Jesus that's enough to give God praise for I'm not even talking about the times when your back was against the wall and he made a way out of no way I'm not talking about because you were living in sin and God pulled you up and saved your soul that's enough to give God thanks and praise for so come on let me hear you shout hallelujah hallelujah hallelujah, hallelujah. hallelujah. God is indeed worthy of our praise he's indeed worthy of all the honor that we can give unto him we just want to thank you you are worshiping at the historic bethel baptist church for those who are watching us live via all of our social media platforms we welcome you into service this morning we thank you that you would like that you would share that you would subscribe comment emojis now y'all who in the service that don't mean y'all stay silent now when the Lord hits you, when the Holy Spirit hits you, you say what? Hallelujah. You put your hand up, you clap. Come on. We have to give God all that he is doing, that he is deserving of. We're going to open up this morning with Psalm 8. And it says, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion, over the works of thy hands that has put all things under his feet all sheep and oxen yea and the beasts of the field the fowl of the air and the fish of the sea and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the seas O lord our lord how excellent is thy name in all the earth we say welcome king of kings we say welcome lord of lords we declare that you are high and lifted up and your train is filling this temple on today. Come on, people of God, if you know that the Lord is excellent in all of his ways, his wonders to perform, that's enough to give God thanks and praise for. We go right into our congregational hymn. It says, we praise, we praise thee, O God. Amen, amen.
Last verse here says, Glory to thee, O God most high. Father, we praise thy majesty. The Son, the Spirit, we adore. One Godhead, bless forevermore. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. It is in him that we live, we move, we breathe. We have our being. So we have this opportunity today to worship him, to exalt him in song, to lift praises unto a God who is worthy. And so let us sing this last verse to the honor and to the glory of Almighty God. Glory to thee, O God most high. Glory to thee, most God, most high. shout hallelujah. Let the church shout praise the Lord. Praise Amen. Amen and amen. As we go into our time of prayer, we're going to call Reverend Arnold Hutchison to lead us, and then we're going to have our invocational song, Lead Us Heavenly Father, Lead Us. Heavenly Father, we bless you this morning for your mercies toward us, for your presence in our lives, your purpose for our lives, your power over our lives. Thank you, God, for this blessed opportunity to fellowship with those of like mind who, in relationship with you, appreciate how wonderful, how just, and how holy you are. God, we bless you as we prepare for your word from your manservant, your vessel for the hour. And ask, O oh God, that you will save him from himself and hide him behind the cross. Help him to die to self in the pulpit so that life might germinate in the pew. We thank you for the moderator this morning and ask your blessings upon her. We thank you for all who share this pulpit and for those who worship in this edifice, that we, O oh God, may know you and the power of your resurrection in our lives. Thank you for those whose hearts are now prepared, whose minds are open for the move of your spirit 
in their lives and who by their giving of their tithes and their offerings display an obedience born of sacrifice validated by purpose augmented by your presence and then O oh God we pray that after we have experienced the mountaintop of worship and fellowship that we will leave this place transformed to transform that our communities our homes our jobs and our places that we frequent may all know that we have been with Jesus. We bless you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Our invocational hymn, Lead Us, Heavenly Father, Lead Us. Lead us, Heavenly Father, Lead us. Keep us, feed us, for we have no help but thee. Yet was blessing, every blessing, if our God, our Father, be. Testament reading, and it will be brought to us by Sister Cheryl Williams, and it comes from Psalm 37, verses 1 through 12. We ask that you would stand for the reading of the word, and at the end of it, our response is, thanks be unto God. Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass, and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord, and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thy heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as thy noonday. Rest in the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger, and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil, for evil doers shall be cut off. For those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be, Yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. 
but the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of the peace. The wicked plotted against the just and gnashed upon him with his teeth. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Sister Cheryl. It's now time for our welcome, our official welcome. We welcome you into service on today. We are glad to have you worshiping with the oldest continuing Baptist church in the Bahamas, but also in the Caribbean. Am I correct? Continuous. Continuous, yes. And we are celebrating over 231 years of witness, of gospel witness. That's enough, I said, to give God thanks and praise for. We've been on this hill for many, many years declaring that God is worthy. And so today, as you worship with us, we extend the invitation to you that you can just you know, if you need to dance in the aisle, you go ahead and dance in the aisle. Show some teeth behind these masks. Come on, let me see. Let me see some smiles behind the masks because we are thankful that God has brought you to Bethel. And think it not strange. You might have come for a christening. You might have come for something else. But know that God will bless you on this morning. You are not here by accident. We know that God has a mighty word for you. You will be blessed by our music and our fellowship and we give God thanks that your life will be transformed and you will not be the same. Amen, Bethel? And we extend another welcome to our social media platforms. We invite you to comment, even if you are watching from wherever you are, the United States or wherever around the world, place it in the chat so that we can make contact with you. We thank you for joining us on this morning. This is in pursuit of wholeness, the promotion of unity, and we have come to worship the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. Amen? Amen. Right now, we're going to have a powerful solo by none other than Sister Irun Claridge. We ask that you would just put your hands together and expect a move of God today. The turbulence surrounding you, these trying times are so hard to endure. In the middle of what seems to be your darkest hour, hold fast your heart. And be assured This too shall pass Every night that's come before it He'll never give you More than you can bear This too shall pass So in this thought Thought you be comforted. 
it's in his hands this too shall pass so set your eyes set them on the mountain and lift your head up to the sky to the other side this too shall pass like every night that's come and gone before it he won't give you a reading more than we could bear this too This too shall pass It's in the Lord's hands This too Hallelujah. If you believe this too shall pass, come on, let's place it in his hands, whatever it is. I hope that you are comforted on this morning that God is reassuring you that the season that you in shall pass, that you don't have to give up, that you don't have to throw in the towel. He's got you. This too shall pass. Oh, you just need to stick it out. Come on, stick it out. Hang in there. Know that God has got you. He has not forgotten about you. Thank you, Sister Aaron, for encouraging us. This too shall pass. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. We're going to go right now into our offertory, offertory uh, period where everyone can participate. And we're going to ask Deaconess Maud Stirrup if she would come and give our offertory prayer. Let us pray. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto us. Every morning is a new mercy that we see. And all that we have needed, God, you provided it for us. We thank you for your faithfulness unto us. Father God, we come today. We thank you, dear God, for the gift of offering the tithes, dear God, that we are about to give. We thank you, dear God. This is just a portion of what you have blessed us with, dear God. Father God, we bring the ushers, dear God. We ask the blessings upon them as they collect the money, dear God. Oh, Father God, we just thank you today, dear God. We thank you, dear God, that the money that is being collected will be to further your gospel here on earth. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'd like to give to this ministry, there are four opportunities for you to give. One, you can give to us through our Royal Bank of Canada account, our main branch account, the account number 2895688, or through our Bank of the Bahamas account. The main branch again, branch code 157, account number 135-000-1435. Otherwise, you can give through an internal transfer if you have a Royal Bank account or a Bank of the Bahamas account, a bank-to-bank -bank transfer if you have online banking from another institution, or over-the-counter if you happen to be in one of those institutions and would like to make a deposit over the counter. Or if you'd like, you can simply go to our website, 
Historic Bethel Baptist and click on our Give button. That will give you an opportunity to give via credit or debit card. And you can specify exactly which ministry you would like to give funds to so that we can direct those funds accordingly. God bless you. Praises unto God, sing praises. Sing praises unto God, sing praises. Hallelujah. Sing praises. Ooh, sing praises unto God, sing praises. Sing praises unto God, sing praises. Hallelujah. Sing praises. Sing praises, sing praises unto God, sing praises. Sing praises unto God, sing praises. Hallelujah. For God is our King. Hallelujah. Oh, for God is our King over all. Oh, sing praises unto Him with understanding. All ye people, oh, for he is to be praised, to be for God is our king, for God is our king over all the earth. Sing praises unto him with understanding. Oh, so clap your, clap your hands. All ye people, oh, for he is to be praised, to be When praised. trouble in your life, oh, when trouble in your life, he praises. Oh, I tell you, when trouble in your life, he praises. Hallelujah. When there's trouble, when there's trouble, in trouble in your life, he Oh, trouble, 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 trouble. Yeah. Oh, hallelujah. When trouble, when trouble in your life, when trouble in your life, trouble, trouble, trouble in your life, oh, yeah, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. For God is our King. For God is our King over all the earth. Sing praises unto praises unto Him. Understanding, oh, so clap your hands and shout, oh, all the people. Oh, sing, oh, He is to be praised. When there's trouble in li your life, what you do? When trouble in your life, sing praises. Oh, when trouble, 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 trouble. Hallelujah. When trouble in your life. Oh, when trouble, trouble in your life, sing praises. Oh, when trouble in your life, sing praises. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. For God is our king. God is our king. Over all the earth. So praise this unto him. For understanding. So clap your hands and shout. All ye people. So he is to be praised. Let's run now. Let us run. You like running, running, skipping. Oh, and praise the Lord for what he has done for me. He has set Let's run, y'all. Running, skipping. Oh, and praise the Lord. He has done for. Let's run one more time. 
Oh, I feel like running. Oh, I'm skipping. Praise the Lord for what he has done for me. He has set my spirit. Oh, I feel like running. Skipping. Praise the Lord for what he has done for me. I feel like running, skipping, praising the Lord. Hallelujah. For what he has done for who? For me. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I still feel like running. Hallelujah. I, I ain't going to run down here, but bless the Lord, all my soul. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. We're now going to have our New Testament reading. And Brother James Hutchison Sr. will be uh, reading that for us. And it's taken from Luke. Chapter 6, verses 27 to 38. We ask again that you stand for the reading of the word. And remember our response is, thanks be unto God. But I say unto you, which hear, love your enemy. Do good to them which hate you. Bless them that curse you. And pray for them which despitefully use you. And unto him that smitten thee on one cheek, off also the other. And him that take away thy cloak, forbid not to take away thy coat also. Give every man that asks it of thee. And of him that take it away thy good, ask them not again. And as ye would that man should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. For if ye love them which love you, what thank have ye? For sinners also love those that love them. And if ye do good to them, which do good to you, what thank have ye? For sinners also do even the same. And if ye lend to them of whom ye hope to receive, what thank have ye? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love ye your enemy, and do good, and lend hoping for nothing again, and your reward shall be great, and ye shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful, unto the evil. Be ye therefore merciful, as your father also is merciful. Judge not, and ye shall not be judged. Condemn not, and ye shall not be condemned. Forgive, and ye shall be forgiven. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Shall man give unto your bosom? For with the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you. The word of the Lord. Thank you, be unto God. Thank you, Brother James, for reading so eloquently. Amen. I don't know if you uh, caught the theme of both of our Old Testament readings and New Testament reading, and that people in this life will fail you. They will misuse you. They will mistreat you. They will treat you like dirt. But God says, still love them. Still forgive them. I know everyone in here has had somebody reject them, has had somebody despise them, had a loved one, um, not love you, <laughs> but God says, still to turn the other cheek, eh? Still love them with the love of God. Show them the more excellent way, and that is the way of Christ. So let us be guided to this week, because I know you probably will encounter a situation where you might have to turn the other cheek, you might have to grind on your back teeth and not say a few choice words, walk away and say, God... Forgive them, for they know not what they do. All right? Amen to those readings on today. We are now ready for the word of God. Who is ready for the word today? It is the meat that we have come for so that we can be transformed, so that we can be changed, but also so that we can be challenged 
to go out there and to be God's people. And so our word for today comes from none other than our moderator, Brother Ishmael Lightburn. And so we know that God has, he has spent time in the word. And so we need to pull on the Holy Spirit today so that Brother Ishmael can just pour the word on us so that we can receive what God has for us on today. Who wants to leave empty? I don't want to leave empty today. I want to leave what? Full. I don't want to wait till I go home and have my Sunday dinner. Y'all look like y'all want to wait till y'all go home to have your Sunday dinner be- to make sure you're full. You need to have the word of God. So you need to anticipate it, expect a blessing on today. And y'all, y'all come here to sit down and just come to church, right? So, no, I, I come for something, eh? I come for me today. I come to be filled with the love of Christ. I come to be challenged today. You need to come expecting. If you, if you don't expect nothing, <laughs> you ain't gonna get nothing. Expect it. Expect great things on today. And so, Brother Ishmael, we say preach the word of God today, sir. Preach it full and free. Be led by the Spirit of God. After the selection by our Bethel's chorale, we will hear the voice of our moderator. Hear ye him. Please give our chorale a mighty hand of praise. Encourage them. Dr. Flo is our director on this morning. Corral, sing, sing, sing. Amen. 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 There's a peace in my heart that the world never did. A peace it cannot take away. Though the trials of life may sound like a cloud, I have peace. Constantly abiding, constantly abiding, Jesus is mine, yes, Jesus is mine. Constantly abiding, constantly abiding, rapture divine, rapture divine. He will never leave me, never leave me lonely.
this treasure I have in the temple of clay, while there on his footstool I roll. But he's coming to take me some glorious day. Let the church shout praise the Lord. Give that choir again another round of applause for constantly abiding. I trust indeed today you are constantly abiding in the word of God, in his love, in his presence. Because we are told that in his presence there is fullness of joy. And at his right hand there are pleasures evermore. I give respect to the Holy Spirit who is evidently here in a very real way. And I want to thank uh, Deaconess Keisha Russell for her energetic yet smooth ordering of our service today. God bless you. Amen. To my pulpit colleagues, Reverend Arnold Hutchison, Reverend Chris Brown, and Deaconess Maud Stirrup. Unto you, my brothers and sisters in the Lord, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to read for you today from the Acts of the Apostle, chapter 26. Acts chapter 26. And I will read from verse 11 through 18. Verse 11 through 18 of Acts chapter 26. And I punish them often in every synagogue and compel them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto foreign cities. Whereupon as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests. At midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining round about me and them who journeyed with me. 
And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the goad. And I said, who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise, stand upon thy feet. For I have appeared unto thee for the purpose to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles and unto whom I send thee. And this verse embraces the crux of my message, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness into light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them who are sanctified by faith in me. Let's pray. Lord God, open our eyes, open our hearts, open our minds, but above all, open our understanding, so your word as spoken today may go forth clearly and simply. The hearts of your people may be enriched, and God, you the only wise God, will be glorified. This is our prayer, in Jesus' name, amen. I want to speak to you on the pure gospel. Say that for me, the pure gospel. I'm sure that most of you who are familiar with the New Testament would agree with the proposition that the Apostle Paul is undoubtedly the greatest of all the apostles. Even though he was not one of the 12 original apostles, but was met by Jesus on the road to Damascus, where Jesus turned his life around, he was by far the most outstanding of all of the apostles. In fact, he says himself, not in a boastful way or arrogant way, but in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter and the 10th verse, he states, by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain, but I labor more abundantly than them all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was within me. Let us examine some of the many accomplishments of this great apostle. Isn't it amazing? that Paul, the fanatical Jew, the Pharisee, the Hebrew of Hebrews, should be transformed into God's messenger to the Gentiles, a despised race. Oh, the transforming power of our God. Doesn't our God change? Luke, the writer of the book of Acts, portrays Paul as the dominant character from the 13th chapter of Acts right on to the 28th chapter. The stories are all about his missionary endeavors. He was a prolific writer of the 27 books that are in the New Testament. Did you know that 14 of them, more than half, were written by the Apostle Paul? And you know, he was not just some armchair author sitting in an air-conditioned environment. Most of his writings was done on his missionary journeys when he was tent-making or even in the prison. Isn't that something you can praise God even in the prison? We have what is known as his prison epistles, his letter to the Romans, 
is the most comprehensive and thorough presentation of the gospel ever to be found in scripture. And one writer describes him as the greatest church missionary and the articulator and the systematizer of the Christian theology. Some of his writings are so near and dear to us as Christians. And you are so familiar with his love story in 1 Corinthians. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not love, I become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Or you may love quoting from that rich doxology. Doxology is a praise. That's all it is. Praise. And he loved these praise. In Ephesians 3 and 20. Now unto him who is able to do more exceedingly abundantly than all that we can ask or think. When in doubt, we question our faith and salvation. He gives us the grand assurance we need from Romans 8. What shall separate me from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? When we go through the veil of sorrow and sadness, he comforts us, this great Paul. He comforts us with the words from 2 Corinthians, the first chapter, and the third verse, Blessed be the God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of all mercies, and the God of all comforts, who does what? Comforts us in the time of our tribulations. And finally, as Paul concludes his great epistle to the Romans, he wrote in an almost illimitable, he rose almost to the illimitable heights in grand declaration. He says, all the depth of the wisdom, of the riches, of the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. You can't trace them. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Or who hath been his counselor? Or who hath first given to him that he shall recompense them again? For from him and to him and through him are all things to whom be glory. Isn't our God worthy of praise? This great apostle traveled some 8,000 miles, that's 1,000 miles on land, on the sea, by foot, and on horseback. You think some of our ministers have it easy? You check, you check up the Apostle Paul out and see the kind of ministry that he conducted. And in these journeys, he went through Asia, mainly in Turkey. He went through Europe, Greece, and a number of the other surrounding countries to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ to the Jew and to the Gentile alike. But primarily to the Gentiles, because as he declared in Romans chapter 1 and 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, because it's what? The power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. Now, this great apostle is finished with his third missionary journey. He is in Rome. He, he is rather in, in Jerusalem. He ended his third missionary journey in Jerusalem. And after all that he had accomplished and all that he had achieved, you would have think that there would be a celebration party waiting to receive him. No, not at all. Instead, the Jews had gathered in a mob and were ready to beat him to death, only to be rescued by the Roman garrison. But then he suffered the ongoing humiliation of imprisonment, two trials before Governor Felix, 
and the Jews. And now, two years later, in prison, in the fortress, Caesarea, he is again on, on trial. This time, before King Agrippa and Governor Festus. And what does he do in defense of his charges that were made against him? Testifies. What does he do? He testifies. He tells God, or he tells the people about the goodness of God in turning his life around. Do you have a, a testimony today? I don't mean if you are singing in the choir or the chorale or or whether you are ushering. So often we come and sometimes we feel that the word of God is going to be sucked into us by osmosis. No, it's not. You got to make that commitment yourself. God doesn't have any grandchildren. Let that sink in for a while. God only has originals, children of God. And so you need to have a testimony yourself. So Paul goes before the king Agrippa. And he testifies. He speaks about the transforming power of Jesus Christ and turning his life around. He was a rebel, deserving condemnation and, and death. And he persecuted the saints. But now here he is, a servant of God. He calls himself a born slave. My God. What a transformation. On slave for Christ. Luke tells us in Acts chapter 19. I say Luke because Luke wrote Acts. Luke said, tells you in, in chapter 9 of his conversion. But Paul himself tells you about his conversion as well. In Acts chapter 22, he was always telling people about the goodness of God in his life. But it's not only in those areas. Paul constantly, if you look through his letters, whether it's in 1 Corinthians, in Galatians, in Philippians, and in Timothy, he was constantly pressing the fact that he was a transformed man. Here he is. In 1 Corinthians, for I am the least of the apostles, that I am not worthy to be called even an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And then he writes to Timothy, and here's what he says to Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and Verse 12, and I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me in that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry who was before a blasphemer, a persecutor, an injurious person. But I obtained mercy because I did it in ignorance and unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love toward Jesus Christ. Yes, the Apostle Paul was a thoroughly saved man who loved Jesus Christ. And that is why he was so eager to preach the gospel and to tell his testimony. He says, I'll tell it to the Jews. I'll tell it to the Gentiles. I'll tell it to the Greeks. I'll tell it to the barbarians. I'll tell it to the bond. I'll tell it to the sea. I'll tell it to the free. Paul was so energized and captivated by the grace of God. He became all things to all men so that he may win some. What a commitment of faith. Do you know that kind of faith? Do you know and have that kind of testimony? Do you know when your dungeon was shaken? And your, your, your chains fell off. The writer of that song, Anne Can It Be, says, no condemnation. He says, my chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose. 
went forth and followed thee. I want to ask you, do you have your own testimony today? Can you testify about the goodness and the greatness of God in not providing you with all your provisions? I take those things as ordinary. They come along as part of the package. But the major theme and the major thrust of the package is to know Jesus and to have him as Lord. Everything else is secondary. But there's something else very special about Paul's testimony. If you have read all of these and seen all of these areas, if you look at this 26th chapter, he speaks more thoroughly about his conversion anywhere else. Let's look at it together. He says, I'm sending you to the Gentiles. To do what? Open their eyes. What does that tell you? That they're blind. Secondly, to turn them from darkness to light. What does that tell you? That they are engrossed in darkness. To turn them from the power of Satan unto God. Three things Jesus tells Paul to, to instructs Paul to go and, and spread about man. Man is a finite and a sinful being. Jesus was telling him in no uncertain terms that he's blind. He's groping in darkness and that he is dominated by Satan. Now, we in our own selves don't really think that is happening to me. You ain't talking about me. I dress in my fancy suit and I live in my fancy house and I drive my fancy car. No, no, no. This could not be referring to me. Yes, it is. Me and you. God says all men are sinners in his sight. So, he first describes the condition of man. Secondly, and this is what I like, there's always a remedy with God. Say, God always has a remedy. God always has a remedy. And that remedy here, he says, that they may receive what? Forgiveness for their sins. And it doesn't stop there. One more ingredient. And that they may receive an inheritance. Say inheritance. An inheritance among those who are sanctified. You see, my brothers and my sisters, these three elements. These three elements. The condition of man. One. God's remedy to the condition of man, too. God's inheritance for man. These are what form the basis of my subject today, the pure gospel. Let's spend a brief moment to analyze each of these elements. Firstly, the condition of man. Note that Jesus instructs Paul about the condition of man. He, he describes his situation as dire and desperate. Firstly, he says to Paul, I'm sending you to open their eyes. That means mankind is spiritually blind. He has a mask. He has scales in his eyes. That's me and you. Spiritually speaking, we are blind toward God. And in fact, the Apostle Paul is even more extreme in some of his writings, he says, for you who he hath quickened, who are what? Dead in your trespasses and sin. Then Jesus says to Paul, I'm sending you so that you can turn them from darkness to light. He says man is groping. He's groping in the dark. He needs to be rescued. Being blind is bad enough. But the situation is compounded because all around them is gross darkness. And finally, on the condition of man, Jesus says, to turn him from the power of Satan. 
unto God. That tells us not only is he blind, not only is he groping in darkness, but he is under the complete domination of Satan. Somewhat reminds me of the nursery rhyme. Little Bo Peep has lost a sheep and doesn't know where to find it. I wouldn't go any further than that. The Apostle Paul is in full agreement with this sad picture because he writes in 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, he says, speaking about man in his unregenerate state, he says, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them that do not believe, lest the light of the glorious gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. The Bible looks at man from God's perspective and sees man as hopelessly lost. He sees him as a sinner ruined from the fall. The history of mankind throughout civilization, or I might add or say it may be better said that it's uncivilization, because if you look at the history of mankind, we have been all very uncivilized in our behavior. We've displayed rebellion to God and hatred toward our fellow man. Think of the wars, the wars that have been conducted through the ages. When man's humanity to man or inhumanity to man was on full display. Think of the two world wars in the last century where millions of people, civilians and soldiers, were slaughtered. Think of the six million who in the Holocaust, because of the enemy and the bitterness and the hatred of Hitler and the Nazi party, and also a very complacent ch church and people, allowed that to happen. Man is quite beastly in his nature. Think, too, of how the Europeans, the perpetrators of the slave trade, took many of our forefathers from their homes in West Africa, Ghana, and Nigeria, and, and, and sometimes the Congo, ripped them away from their families, and took them thousands of miles across the Atlantic, many of them dying and being thrown overboard. Man's inhumanity to man is still very much alive today. But think of some of the things today. Look at the US today. The black American is not that much better off than he was a few hundred years ago. He's still struggling for the right to vote. Can you imagine a black Man, especially if he's a young man driving a Mercedes in the U.S., you better be on your P's and Q's because racial profiling is on high on the agenda. And then when we come to our own little country, the level of violence continues unabated, especially gender-based violence, where our women and our children are sometimes abused, and beaten, and sometimes even die. Think of it where economic inequality is very widespread, and particularly in these last two years during the pandemic, that widespread nature of our inequality has become even more pronounced. And then there is the prospect of another war right at our doorstep where the Russians are threatening the Ukrainians. And if you haven't been around in the Second World War, that would be a joke if we were to see another war. Man's heart is deceitful. In fact, Jeremiah says, the heart of man is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? John's first letter, to the church, he says, if we say we have no sin, 
We do what? We deceive us. You're only fooling yourself. And the truth is not in you. But if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just. And then let me conclude this by saying where the Apostle Paul says, as is it in Romans chapter 3, and then verse 10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understand it. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. All we like sheep, says Isaiah, have gone astray. That's the condition of man. My brothers and sisters, sin is universal. And there's plenty of it all around. The evidence is abundant. One of the biggest evidence of that sin is death itself. Death is one of the penalties of sin. I mean our physical death. Jesus, oh, our God said to Adam and Eve, from dust thou art, but the dust thou shalt return. Man cannot help himself spiritually. He cannot, as we sometimes say, pull himself up by his own bootstraps. And this is why God needs to intervene, and he has. Isn't it good that God has intervened? Don't we have a great God who has intervened for man, for you and for me? And thus far, you've really heard only bad news, but the gospel really isn't about bad news. The gospel is about good news. And indeed, that is what it really is all about. And that good news centers around the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus. That's the message. That's the message that needs to be told today. If you read Acts, in those, virtually every chapter of it talks about the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It is that that provides the transformation for man, not your education. Not your money, not your wealth, not your fame, not your popularity. It is the gospel and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ that needs to be proclaimed. Forgiveness. It's been referred to in a couple of our readings already. Forgiveness is the business of God. That's what he does. Isn't God good? He doesn't need to. He doesn't have to. But he offers it. It is God's prerogative. And his alone. And he has made forgiveness freely available to all who would come to him in faith. The very nature and being of God is love and forgiveness. In Exodus chapter 34 and verse 6, where Moses was brought up into the mountain to seek God, God declared himself to him. He said, listen, listen to what he says. The Lord, the Lord, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands and forgiving transgressions and sin. Isn't our God great? That is why our sanctuary choir sometimes sing that great and beloved song, Great God of Wonders. One of the verses says, In wonder, lost with trembling joy, we take the pardon of our God, pardon of deepest dye, a pardon wrath with Jesus' blood. Who is a pardoning God like thee? Or who hath grace so rich and free? Have you known of that grace? David in the 32nd Psalm says, Blessed is the man whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute, or he doesn't charge you with iniquity. Or again in the 
103rd Psalm. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. What comes first? Who forgiveth my God, thine iniquity. That's first and foremost. He forgiveth thine iniquity. And then later in that psalm it says, as far as the east, Brother Toby, is from the west. So far hath he removed, taken away our transgressions from us. You know, during the earthly ministry of our Lord, he offered forgiveness of sin. He told the paralyzed man in Luke 5, man, thy sins be forgiven. He told the woman who came to the house of the leper, Simon, the Pharisee, and washed his feet with her tears and dried them with the hair. He told her much to the chagrin and disappointment of the Pharisees, your sins, which are many, are forgiven. On the cross, one of the final words of Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It doesn't end there, you know. Jesus is now in heaven carrying out the priestly ministry, the kingly ministry. And that's why the writer to the Hebrew admonishes us. He says, seeing we have an high priest gone up into the heavens, let us therefore do what? Come boldly unto the throne of grace, where we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Man needs forgiveness today. Man's sin problem cannot be resolved by social advancement, by a good education, by scientific and technological achievements and, discoveries, and, uh, and discoveries. These, while they are good, will bring about only reform. Reform is good, but what man needs is transformation. The Apostle Paul says in Romans 12, Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. He needs to be born again. Man's greatest need is the forgiveness of God. The wonderful thing about it is God is willing. God is able. Is he able? To grant you the forgiveness. Because he is in the business of forgiving. And his very nature and name is love. The third element of this pure gospel brings us to the last segment. He says, I call you to tell them that they will receive an inheritance. Say inheritance. I know we sing sometimes that song, enlarge my territory. But I don't just want the territory to be enlarged down here. I want my, because everything down here fades. Everything down here falters. Everything down here ultimately is destroyed. But I want my territory in heaven to be enlarged. And here Paul says, Jesus says to Paul, tell them I've called them that they may receive an inheritance. An inheritance is a gift. It's something you haven't done anything for. Now, if you were a Christian, you've already received the deposit. It's only a deposit of that greater inheritance. You remember the story of Abraham in the 14th chapter of, of Genesis? Abraham Lot went down to Sodom and he was captured. And there were some kings. There were four kings on one side and five kings on another side. And Abraham wanted to rescue his son or his, his, his nephew. And Abraham went along with, 
with, with the four kings and they defeated the five kings. And when they came back, they brought all the people and they had all the goods. And of course, for Abraham, his nephew Lot. And the king of Sodom said to Abraham, let's divide the spoil. Why don't you take the people? Why don't you take all the goods and I will take the people? Obviously, the people were more valuable than the goods, weren't they? Abraham says to you, look, look here, Jack. I ain't taking one shoelace from you or even a sandal. Because I don't want you or people to think that you made Abraham rich. God is the possessor, he says, of all the earth. And God is my portion. That's your inheritance, my brothers. That is your inheritance. Also, Paul says in Corinthians, I have not seen, is, have not heard, nor has it entered into the hearts of man the things that God has stored up for them who love him. Tell somebody you got inheritance. Jesus himself says, John 14, in my father's house, there are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go, I will come. And I will take you to my son. And then let me finally conclude on this particular subject in quoting from Peter's, this is such a beautiful verse in 1 Peter chapter 1 and the third verse where he again talks about this regeneration and also the inheritance. He says, blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who through his abundant mercy hath begotten us into a living hope by the resurrection from the dead of our Lord Jesus Christ. Unto, and this is a part, an inheritance that is incorruptible, that is undefiled, and that does not fade away. You hear that? And then he adds one more thing. Reserved in heaven for you. I ain't making that up, you know. That's what it says in the scriptures incorruptible. You see, the houses that we build, the cars that we drive, these are all temporary things. You will either leave them behind, or you may see them even taken away from you for one reason or another. But oh, I have a building, as the Apostle Paul says. I have a house not made with hands. I have a place reserved for me, an inheritance you need today to claim your inheritance. It begins with the deposit of your salvation in Jesus Christ. You need to know him. You need to love him. You need to serve him. You need to give your life to him. That's where it begins. I'm a glad pilgrim on my way going to the glory land. Jesus my only hope and stay holdeth me by the hand. Paul's mandate, my brothers and sisters, is your mandate as well. We are called as a church to rescue the perishing, to care for the dying, and there are plenty out there, to snatch them in pity from sin and the grave. We are called to weep all the erring ones, to lift up the fallen, to tell them of Jesus, the mighty to save. Man is blind. He needs to be rescued. Man is, man is groping in darkness. He needs, there is an urgency about it. He needs to be rescued. Man is under the domination of sin and Satan. He needs to be rescued. One of these days where we go to receive our inheritance, 
We can shout and sing. Oh, I want to see him. I want to look upon his face. Tell the saints in glory of his saving grace on the streets of glory. Let me lift my voice. Heaven at last, home at last, ever to rejoice. As I take my seat, I recall a song, a, a, a story of two old missionaries returning home from almost 30 years of ministry in, in some parts of Asia and some parts of Europe. And they were returning on a ship and the band began to play as they pulled into the dock in New York and the missionaries felt that this was grand celebration for them. Little did they knew there was the president on board, the president of the United States. And the band was actually playing for them. And the wife of the missionary says, I'm so disappointed. I thought that was for us in our returning. Her husband turned to her and says, my dear, don't worry. We haven't reached home yet. Do you have an inheritance? Make sure you claim your inheritance. Make sure you make your calling an election show. Open their eyes. Turn them from darkness to light. From the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance into the eternal kingdom of our God. That is pure gospel. Amen. We thank God for the manner in which he used our moderator today in delivering the word of God the gospel of Jesus Christ was delivered in simplicity in a way that we can certainly understand and relate to this all important message to each and every one of us. And you know, as he shared the gospel, he was very detailed and very meticulous in his delivery. And he reminded us of some truths the fact that we are people perishing, that this world is in darkness and is full of sin. He reminded us that man in and of himself can do nothing to help his situation. But Jesus. And you know, God, because of his love, for mankind. He didn't send us a teacher. He didn't send us a financial analyst. He didn't send us a psychologist. He didn't send us a philosopher. He sent this lost and dying world a savior. He sent us a savior because of his love for mankind, because of the fact that man could do nothing to redeem himself. God sent his only son, Jesus Christ, into the world to make available to you and I a lifeline to provide for us the precious gift of salvation. And so the gospel has been preached today in its fullness. Those of us who are here in the sanctuary, we were able to hear the gospel. Others of us 
joining in by way of live stream and the social media platforms. You heard today the gospel. So my job is simple. Simply to extend to those of us having heard the gospel the opportunity for you to respond. That if you know in your heart that you have not embraced this gift of salvation, this lifeline that was extended to you today, to come out of sin and receive the gift of Jesus Christ, to allow him to come into your life and be your Lord and Savior. We are extending you that opportunity right now. Right where you are. If you are under the sound of my voice. If you're here in the sanctuary, you can acknowledge by simply just raising your hand, having heard the gospel today, that if you don't know Jesus Christ, if you have yet to accept him as Lord and Master, this is your opportunity Right where you are, you can just lift your hand in acknowledgement and say, Preacher, pray for me that I may accept this gift of salvation that was extended today. If that's you, just raise your hand. And for that one who may be joining us by way of live stream, the invitation is extended to you also. I can't see you. I can't see you raising your hand if that's you. But guess what? God is an all-seeing God. He's an omnipresent God. He's an omniscient God. He sees you. And so right where you are, if you're in your bedroom, if you're in the kitchen, if you're in your automobile, if you're out in your yard, wherever you are, if you're tuning in and you heard this message today, this is your opportunity to respond. And so we want to just lead you in what we call the sinner's prayer and ask you to repeat these words after us. And as you do so, we admonish you to do so, believing in faith. It's not so much about a feeling, but it's about what you believe in your heart as you repeat these words. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, I come today having heard the gospel. I declare even now that I receive your gospel today. I believe in my heart that your son Jesus Christ died for my sins. And that you raised him from the dead. And I confess it with my mouth now. I claim right now that I receive Jesus Christ into my life to be my Lord and Savior. Thank you for forgiving me of all my sins. Thank you that I can declare that I am now a new creation in Christ Jesus. I am now an heir and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. I am now a child of God. And I promise that from this day forth, I will serve you as my Lord and Savior throughout the countless ages of eternity. Amen. Let us just continue to pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for this opportunity that you have extended to us to come together as the people of God to hear your word as you spoke to our hearts through your man, your man's servant. We receive your word today. God, we thank you that even now it is taking root in our hearts and we are being encouraged we are being built up. We are being strengthened as a result of your word today. Continue to have your way in our lives, O oh God. Continue to shape us and mold us into vessels of honor. 
that we may be bold and courageous, that we may be vessels that would allow the light of Jesus Christ to be seen in and through us, in our homes, on our jobs, as we move about in our communities, that the light of Christ would be seen in us, and that it would all be for your honor and for your glory. Thank you once again for all that you have accomplished in and through us this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our closing song is Tell Me the Old, Old Story. We're going to ask that you stand and let us sing unto the glory of God. Tell me the old, old story of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love. Amen.
Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and evermore. And let the church say, Amen. Join us for the following auxiliary meetings via Zoom. Bible study every Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. Girls Brigade every Friday at 4 p.m. Prayer meeting every Saturday at 7 a.m. Men's fellowship every second and fourth Saturday at 6 p.m. And tune in to 107.9 FM every Saturday at 10 a.m. for Bethel Speaks to the Nation. Special prayers are requested for Sister Bernice Ballard, Sister Kenya Keery, Brother Bruce Delancey, Sister Charlene Lightborn, Sister Constance Mackey, Sister Ruth Miller, and Sister Elva Rule. As we assemble together week after week, we are constantly mindful and prayerful for the sick and shut-in of this nation and of this church. Prayers are requested for Edward Fitzgerald, Dorothy Hanna, Sheila Hepburn, Jenny Hinsey, Sally Hutchinson, Barbara Jones, Constance Mackey, Sylvia Munnings, Marjorie Murphy, Charlene Neely, Antoinette Pinder, Shamula Pinder, Carmetta Ramming, Francis Richards, Maxine Roll, Sarah Roll, Sydney Stirrup, Notlin Simmons, Isabel Strawn, Murda Sweeting, Jennifer Util Rule, Carly Wilson, Lillian Wilson, Marie Winters, and Antoinette Wiley. Know that we love you, we are thinking of you, and we are praying without ceasing for you. Moderator Ishmael Lightborn, the officers and members of Bethel, extend sincere condolences to Sister Ruby Neely and family on the passing of her sister Virginia Ferguson, and to Sister Yvonne Storr and family on the passing of her brother Alfred Lightborn. May God grant you his peace and strength as you go through this difficult time. Happy anniversary greetings are extended to Brother Wilton and Sister Alfreda Lightborn as they celebrate 48 years of marriage, and Brother Dawn and Sister Yvette Knowles as they celebrate 19 years of marriage. May God continue to richly bless and strengthen your unions. Baptismal or Christian Discipleship classes will begin on Tuesday, March 1st at 6.30 p.m. via Zoom. If you are interested in becoming a member of Bethel and would like to be baptized, or if you have come on your Christian experience to join the church, or you have just given your life to Christ and may not be sure what to do next, please call Rev. Pat Bethel at 323-5000 to sign up for classes. An executive council meeting has been scheduled for Monday at 6 p.m. at the church. All members of the council are asked to be in attendance as important matters will be discussed. There will be a meeting for all church members on Monday, February 28th at 6 p.m., at which time important matters will be discussed. All members are expected to attend. The opening of the annual Baptist Power and Praise Revival of the Baptist Convention will be held on Sunday, February 27th at Bethel Baptist Church at 6.30 p.m. All are invited to attend. 
We invite you to join us this Sunday at our 7.45 a.m. or 11 o'clock a.m. worship service. If you are unable to join us in person, please tune in to our live stream at www.historicbethelbaptist.org or on Facebook at Historic Bethel Baptist. For more information, please contact the church's office at 323-5000.